Now we're going to move on and talk about tachyarrhythmias. The tachyarrhythmias we're going to talk about are supraventricular tachycardia, particularly atrial fib, which is a subset of supraventricular tachycardia, ventricular tachycardia, and then how to differentiate supraventricular from ventricular tachycardia. And then we'll talk a little bit about ventricular fibrillation at the end. So supraventricular tachycardia is rapid rhythms that originate either in the atria, around the AV junction, above the bundle of Hiss, or rhythms that involve the atria or the AV junction as a crucial component of a circuit. We identify supraventricular tachycardia by P waves that look different than normal, a QRS complex that usually looks normal, upright and narrow, the exception again is bundle branch block, and a PR interval that is usually constant. It can be caused from an abnormal automatic focus in the atrium or a reentry circuit. The heart rate is rapid with supraventricular tachycardia and the rhythm may be continuous or intermittent. If it's intermittent, it's called paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia. The causes include dogs with severe uh, heart disease and it can be congenital in Labrador retrievers, so we'll see it in young labs. And then we can see it in cats with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or hyperthyroidism. Now the goal of treatment for most supraventricular tachycardias is not to stop the arrhythmia, but to slow conduction through the AV node. What matters is slowing the ventricular response rate due to the rapid atrial rhythm. So the atria can be very, very, very fast, but what matters is perfusion, and perfusion is affected by the ventricular rate. So slowing that down is usually enough to improve perfusion. We can try a vagal maneuver, so pressure on the eyeballs or the carotid sinus can sometimes terminate the rhythm. But generally, treatment is with calcium channel blockers, so our first choice is diltiazem. Now, diltiazem will slow conduction through the AV node, so it can often decrease the ventricular response rate enough to improve perfusion. I put magnesium in there because it's important to remember that magnesium is a natural calcium channel blocker. And if you do not have diltiazem around, magnesium can often be used and can be very successful. This is an ECG from supraventricular tachycardia in a boxer before treatment. Lead 2 is in the center. And what you can see is we have an upright and narrow QRS, a very rapid rhythm, no visible P waves. Of course, it would be hard to see them anyway because the rhythm is so rapid. And if you were to look at the, the R to R interval, you would see that it was irregularly irregular. Now, if you look at lead two in the center, you can see we have our rapid rate occurring and then we gave diltiazem. And just as we gave diltiazem, our rate slowed enough that we got a, uh, an escape beat. And you can see we have a wide bizarre complex. That's an escape beat coming from the ventricle. And then we have a supraventricular tachycardia at a much slower rate after the escape beat. So diltiazem is slowing conduction through the AV node and slowing the rate enough that we can improve perfusion. So diltiazem is going to slow the AV nodal conduction so that the atrial rate, which can be 3, 4, 500 beats per minute, does not equal the ventricular rate. And we have time for our ventricle to fill and perfuse the body. The goal, again, is slowing the ventricular rate, not controlling the atrial rate. So atrial fibrillation is a subset of supraventricular tachycardia. It is numerous chaotic impulses that are bombarding the AV node, and it accounts for up to 14% of all canine arrhythmias. It's thought to be a 50% incidence in dilated cardiomyopathy dogs. The Irish Wolfhound is an interesting exception. Uh, they will often have a normal heart, and they have something called lone AFib, and it's where they have an atrial fibrillation but with a slower ventricular rate, and so it's often not treated. Atrial fib is usually complete electrical disorganization, and the atrial depolarizations can be 400 to even up to 1,200 
beats per minute. And you can imagine that we can't let those, those beats go through the AV node to the ventricle or we wouldn't have any time for ventricular filling. So with atrial fibrillation, we have a rapid, irregularly irregular rhythm. No visible P waves. We sometimes see oscillations or F waves, but no visible P waves. The QRS configuration is usually normal. The exception, again, is bundle branch block. So an atrial fibrillation with bundle branch block is going to have a wide QRS complex and it can mimic ventricular tachycardia. A vagal maneuver may slow AV node conduction and let us know that uh, it was a supraventricular tachycardia. With atrial fibrillation, the QRS complexes may vary in amplitude, but the key with atrial fib is this, this is the only arrhythmia of the owner diagnosis. So in all of the other heart diseases, so uh, dilated cardiomyopathy or uh, heartworm disease, or um, if we have mitral regurge, or if we have congestive heart failure. The owner usually complains about the dog's behavior. He's tired, he's having trouble breathing, he can't exercise. In atrial fib, the owner usually calls and says the dog's heart is acting funny or the rhythm is off. And that's because they can actually put their hand against the chest and feel that the heart rate and the heart rhythm is abnormal. And this is a clue for you that that's probably atrial fib. The bottom, uh, this is an ECG of a dog with atrial fib. And the very bottom strip is a, a lead strip. And rhythm, it's a lead two. A rhythm strip, I meant. It's lead two. And you can see that we have upright narrow QRS complexes, a very rapid rate. And if you had calipers, you could see that this is irregularly irregular rhythm. Here's another ECG uh, in a dog with atrial fib. And this dog, um, if you can look at lead two is in the center, you can see that the rhythm is somewhat slower. We cannot see any obvious P waves. We do have upright narrow QRS complexes. And in some cases, perhaps you see uh, F waves, the oscillation waves. It's not 100% clear, but we definitely don't see clear P waves. All right, now we're going to go and talk about ventricular tachycardia. Ventricular tachycardia is defined as three or more ventricular premature complexes in a row. It is from a stimulation of an ectopic focus in the ventricle. It can be intermittent, which is also called paroxysmal or sustained. And the rate must be over 150 beats per minute in dogs. And the QRS must be wide and bizarre. We sometimes see ventricular fusion complexes. We will, uh, the, these are a summation of a ventricular impulse and a supraventricular impulse. I'll show you an image of that in just a minute. And uh, the QRS impulse can be of intermediate morphology and preceded by a P wave. You can see here we have a wide and bizarre complex. And then we have, uh, we're looking at the, um, the little triangle, triangle arrow. So before the triangle arrow, we have an upright, relatively narrow QRS. And then before that is a wide and bizarre. What appears to happen with a fusion complex is that you get the ventricular impulse coming up and the superventricular impulse coming down. And you get a complex that is of intermediate morphology. So it's sort of half ventricular and half supraventricular. And in, in some cases, they almost cancel each other out. And so you can see where we have this arrow that we've got this summation of ventricular and supraventricular. And that's kind of a hallmark of ventricular tachycardia. Another hallmark of ventricular tachycardia is a capture beat. Uh, these can be seen commonly. And it's a supraventricular impulse that goes through the normal conduction pathway to the ventricle during an episode of ventricular tachycardia. It occurs earlier than expected, and it's a narrow, it creates a narrow QRS. So here we have lead two in the center again. And if you start from the left, we have a normal, relatively normal sinus rhythm, one complex. Then we go into four beats of ventricular tachycardia. Uh, 
and then we get our capture beat. The capture beat is highlighted by the blue arrow. The capture beat brings us back into a normal sinus rhythm until we degenerate into VTAC again. With ventricular tachycardia, there's no relationship between the P waves and the QRS complexes. We usually can find P waves due to the rapid ventricular rate. The P waves, however, will have regular intervals, but again, no association. So our P to P rate will be equal or will be consistent, but there's no connection with the QRS complexes. Again, to remember, when we're looking at a ventricular rhythm, so a wide and bizarre complex, it's important to remember it could be an escape. So in an escape rhythm, we're going to have a wide and bizarre complex, and in a VTAC, we're going to have a wide and bizarre complex. The key is that the escape is going to have a slower rate. The, the rate can be as slow as 20 to 40 beats per minute in a dog, 60 to 120 in a cat. Now with VTAC, we have the wide and bizarre rhythm, but we have a very fast rate. Remember though that the ECG can double the rate if we have a tall T wave. So if the T wave is the same as the R wave, we can get double the rate and you've got to listen to that animal to determine if it's an escape rate rhythm or not. We always want to rule out non-cardiac causes of ventricular tachycardia. So the most common causes are, especially in the dog, are hypoxemia, electrolyte or acid-base abnormalities, and pain. Pain is a huge cause of ventricular tachycardia. Other causes of ventricular tachycardia include drugs such as procainamide, sotalol, uh, domperidone, cisapride, chlor chlorpromazone, erythromycin, and many, many other drugs. Treatment for ventricular tachycardia includes, first, always treating the underlying cause. Oxygen therapy, adequate perfusion, and adequate analgesia will often convert some ventricular tachycardias. So we have seen it converted when a dog with a fracture came in and the fracture, dog with an excruciatingly painful fracture, came in on a very, 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 very mild analgesic like butorphanol. And when we put that dog on an appropriate CRI of analgesia, like a fentanyl, lidocaine, ketamine uh, drip, the, the tachycardia went away and we converted to a normal sinus rhythm. So always, always, always treat the underlying cause. Now, having said that, if the rhythm is affecting perfusion and the dog needs to be treated immediately or the rhythm the ventricular tachycardia can sometimes degenerate into a ventricular fibrillation. If it looks like that's happening, we will treat. So our first choice for dogs is lidocaine. Our first choice for cats is procainamide. In dogs, if lidocaine is not working, we'll often add procainamide. Other options that are not as successful in our hands are beta blockers. Sotalol is one that we do treat. Uh, we usually uh, prescribe it orally to go home with for boxers with cardiomyopathy and dogs with Chagas. And then don't forget about magnesium. Magnesium can be a, a phenomenal treatment, especially if you don't have access to lidocaine and procainamide. This is an example of ventricular tachycardia in a boxer. And if you look in the center, we have lead two. We have a relatively upright and narrow QRS complex. We have four complexes that then rapidly degenerate into a ventricular tachycardia. This could almost be a ventricular flutter, which is just before you get ventricular uh, fibrillation. So this needs to be treated. Another example, lead two is in the center. And here we have a ventricular tachycardia or a flutter. This is a really, really, really rapid rate, and there's a very good chance that this will degenerate into fibrillation. Here is an example of ventricular tachycardia in a dog with GDV or gast uh, gastric dilatation volvulus, and um, this dog was treated with lidocaine, but also when the volvulus was resolved, the arrhythmia resolved. Let's move on and talk about some of the nuances in differentiating supraventricular tachycardia from ventricular tachycardia. So the rhythm is supraventricular if the QRS complexes look normal, so they're upright and narrow, 
And that tells us that the impulse is coming from the normal direction or above the bundle of hiss. Here's an example of a supraventricular tachycardia. We have an irregularly irregular rhythm, so it's an atrial fib, no visible P waves, and upright and normal looking QRS complexes. Now we usually think that we have a ventricular tachycardia if the QRS complexes are abnormal, so they're wide and bizarre, as if the impulse is not coming from above the bundle of hiss, as if the impulse is coming from the ventricle itself. However, the exception is bundle branch block. So in bundle branch block, we can have a supraventricular tachycardia where the impulse is coming from somewhere up in the, vent in the uh, atria. And so it's in the supraventricle above the, above the uh, AV junction. But we have wide and bizarre complexes. And the reason we have wide and bizarre complexes is because as the impulse comes down from the SA node through the atria or from somewhere in the atria, through the AV node, when they go down the bundle, one of the bundle branches is blocked and we get our uh, impulse coming backward and we get a wide and bizarre complex. In that case, it can be very, very, very difficult to differentiate a supraventricular tachycardia with bundle branch block from a ventricular tachycardia. So some rules to help us differentiate if we have a wide complex tachycardia and we want to know if it's SVT or VT, the first thing we want to look for are P waves. If we see P waves with a consistent relationship to the QRS, that is consistent with uh, a supraventricular tachycardia with bundle branch block, or it's also called aberration. If we see QRS fusion complexes, that is consistent with ventricular tachycardia. If we, do, we perform a vagal maneuver and it terminates the rhythm, that is more likely to be supraventricular tachycardia. And if we give lidocaine and that terminates the rhythm, it's more likely to be ventricular tachycardia. Now, when in doubt, treat for ventricular tachycardia. So if you're not sure, just go ahead and treat for as if it's a ventricular tachycardia. There's a couple of reasons for this. Number one, Human research suggests that at least 80% of all wide complex tachycardias are ventricular in origin. And the other reason is that it's much safer to treat this way. So the drugs that we use to treat supraventricular tachycardia, the ones that slow the ventricular response rate, so diltiazem, digoxin, beta blockers, they won't stop ventricular tachycardia. So they will not address it or treat it. But, but more importantly, they will worsen hypotension. They often have vasodilatory or negative inotropic effects, and they can make the side effects of ventricular tachycardia much worse. So it is safer to treat for ventricular tachycardia with lidocaine or procainamide. All right, now we're going to go on briefly and talk about ventricular fibrillation. Toussaint de Pont is a particular type of ventricular fibrillation. It's becoming more uh, prevalent due to it being caused by a prolonged QT interval, and a lot of medications are being found to cause prolonged QT interval, certainly in humans. So it is from a prolonged QT interval, and it is seen as rotations of peaks of the QRS complexes. So the QRS complexes seem to oscillate around a baseline or an axis. And so we get this ever-changing geometry of this re-entry circuit. It is congenital in Dalmatians, so we have congenital long QT syndrome in Dalmatian dogs. And we can also see it with hypokalemia, hypocalcemia, toxicity, quinidine, and some, some other drugs. So the second lead from the bottom, or the very bottom lead, is a lead to rhythm strip. And what you can see is that we have larger or more coarse impulses followed by finer impulses fi followed by larger or more coarse impulses. Some people compare this to ribbon candy, they call it, um, and it's basically we're oscillating around a baseline. So this is a, an example of Tressade de Pont. The treatment for this specific arrhythmia, which is a type of ventricular fibrillation and will be deadly, the treatment is magnesium IV, so intravenous boluses of magnesium.
So now talking about uh, ventricular fibrillation in general, V-fib is a chaotic, uncoordinated depolarizations of the ventricle. There's no contractions happening because all of the impulses are not coordinated, so they're preventing contraction. There's no pulse, there's no perfusion, and the animal will be dead very shortly if something's not done. For ventricular fibrillation, the oscillations may be larger or coarse or smaller and fine. Coarse fibrillation is thought to be easier to defibrillate, and epinephrine may convert fine, fine fibrillation waves to coarse waves. This is why you'll often see us giving epinephrine even during defibrillation. So this is an example of ventricular fibrillation, uh, and you can see this is just chaotic, uncoordinated, and the treatment is defibrillation. Treatment can be with um, biphasic or monophasic defibrillators. You can use uh, veterinary defibrillators or you can use one of the AEDs that are common.